Hello, everyone, and welcome to your virtual reunion. We had two great sessions yesterday with Dean David Schmidtlein and faculty members Phil Budden and Fiona Murray. Nearly 500 alumni representing 37 countries all over the world came together as one MIT Sloan community to reconnect and continue learning, and we're just getting started. So thank you for joining us as we continue our virtual reunion celebrations. We would love to be with you in person and welcome you back to campus, but until we can do that, we're thrilled to bring a little bit of the MIT Sloan campus to you. Today, we have Bryn Panay Burkhart joining us from the MIT Sloan Career Development Office. Bryn is no stranger to many of you who have tuned into our webinars in the past, or if you've had the privilege to hear her present at club and regional gatherings or here on campus. Bryn came to MIT Sloan in 2006 and became our dedicated alumni career coach in 2012. She provides alumni career co guidance and coaching, which includes job search strategy, how to effectively use LinkedIn, optimizing your networking, and getting the most out of salary negotiation. We are pleased to have her here today to share her expertise on navigating your career, especially in these uncertain times. Bryn, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. First of all, it's great to be with you today. Who would have thought a few months ago that we'd be doing this from our own homes, but that is the wild and strange state of the world. So before I begin, I have to, of course, acknowledge the fact that these are very different times, and I hope that each of you is managing as best as you're able. We've all had our lives you know, completely upended, some more than others, some quite drastically. So whatever your particular situation is, I do wish you well. And I'm really thrilled that you join me for the next hour. So as I turn to this topic of navigating your career at any age and stage, when I created this workshop, I wanted to provide a, a framework for those in transition who were thinking about their next steps professionally. And I wanted it to be a framework that would enable you to move forward from a place of strength and I wanted it to be relevant to any of you, no matter your age or stage, right? So I assume today some of you are job seeking. Some of you might be considering a move in the near future. Perhaps you're pondering an internal move or a promotion, or maybe you're thinking about retiring and just looking for a new chapter. So I'm ready to talk about how you can do all those things in any of those situations and how you can do that from a place of strength. You know, we're all in transition these days. Wherever we live, we're responding and adapting to the latest coronavirus conditions. I am sure some of you have had your job impacted by this pandemic. Maybe you've been furloughed, maybe the scope of your role has changed. And these are really difficult situations. We don't know what's ahead of us. So there is fear and anxiety. I think what I want you to know though, is that there are elements of your career strategy that you can control. So rather than letting that fear and panic take the wheel, we're gonna ground ourselves today and I'm gonna give you some basic tenets of career management that will serve you well in this current climate and for the rest of your career. So by the end of the hour, you're gonna have a structure for how to move forward with confidence and with purpose in your transition. Now talking about purpose and confidence, let me just kick it off with this next slide. Hmm. There we go, all right, delayed today. So let me show you this excerpt from the literary classic, Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. In this excerpt, Alice is walking down a path and comes to a fork in the road and she sees the Cheshire cat in the tree. So this exchange happens. She says, which road do I take? The cat says, where do you wanna go? Alice says, I don't know. And the cat says, then it doesn't matter. So let's look at this with a career management lens. I would venture to guess that most of you watching today have managed your careers thus far, either passively or reactively, meaning that you haven't necessarily been plotting ahead, you haven't been planning your career direction. So passively means you've taken whatever opportunities have come along, and let's face it, I know that MIT brand has served you well, or you might have just stayed in a role because you were satisfied or even happy. Now, reactively means that you've made a change only when you've been forced to do so. Perhaps your company has restructured or downsized. Maybe you've been fired. 
Maybe you've had to make a geographic move. And so in that case, the inclination is to come from a reactive place, often out of fear or panic, as I said earlier, right? We, you know, start blindly applying to job boards and, and job postings online. We might haphazardly update our resume and LinkedIn. We may email people letting them know that we're looking. What I want you to know is that true career management is not leading with fear. It's about intentionally owning your career. It's about being honest with yourself and willing to reflect upon your entire work history. The self-awareness that comes from that is going to help you clarify your next steps and it's gonna give you a direction so that you don't end up like Alice here. So let's move ahead How do you and get started. How do you begin to think about what's next for you and do it with intention? So I'm gonna give you a quick overview of a framework. So you're just gonna get a broad brush of the framework and then we're gonna spend some time drilling down on each piece of it, but I'm just gonna tee it up for you now. So when I'm working with alumni in transition, I often have them to do two audits, which essentially means making two lists. So the first list, is a list of your strengths and skills. This is your core competencies. These are the things you do well. And I'm gonna show you a series of questions in a minute designed to filter down on your competencies, but essentially you're gonna be scanning your work history or the history of other volunteer work or in activities you participated in. And you're gonna be thinking about how you have brought about results, how you've made an impact. And then from there, you'll then distill or filter out the skills and the strengths you were using to bring about those contributions or those accomplishments. So you'll make this list, then you're gonna cross out the things you no longer wanna do, because let's face it, there are sometimes skills you wanna leave behind. Then we go to our next list. This list is an audit, I call it the required desire list, meaning it's a list of what you need, right? What you require, as well as what you desire, what you prefer to have in your career, given your particular situation. And this is about the work environment or the work life flow that you have. I don't use the word balance because there's no such thing as balance anymore, right? So things that might be considered here include your compensation, your company size, the scope of your role, whether or not you have flexibility, how much you travel, um, the, the length of your commute for when we finally go back to the office. So items like that are considered here. And with this list, you're then going to prioritize it in terms of what's most important for you, given your situation at this time in your career. This is a really important audit because as you can imagine, these things change over time. So they are always worth revisiting anytime you're thinking about a transition. So why is it essential to begin with these two audits and do this list of your skills and your priorities? So these two lists make up the things that you can control in any sort of job transition or transition. So over the years, working with hundreds, probably thousands by now of alums, what I have found is that people are most professionally satisfied, even fulfilled, if they are leveraging talents they enjoy, that's why I have you do the competency list, and when the role or the opportunity aligns or meets with some of their higher priorities. There's actually a third thing too I'm gonna to throw in here. Um, if you've watched any of my other prior webinars, I've talked about the concept of thinking about your career as being in permanent beta. It's a concept I learned from a book called The, Star the Startup of You by Reid Hoffman. He's a founder of LinkedIn. And essentially what that means is think about yourself as a work in progress. No matter how long you've worked, no matter how old you are, you want to think about yourself as being in beta mode, right? The death knell for a job is when we're bored. So as long as you're challenged, there's a stretch, you're able to keep growing, you're able to keep learning, that's another indicator of job satisfaction. So back to these lists. These lists really anchor you and they build your confidence. When you take the time to determine what you bring to the table and what you truly need and want, there's real power in that. And if you take away nothing else from this webinar, I want you to know that preparation and confidence are key drivers to a successful career transition. So rather than being reactive or panicked, right? Who's gonna want me? Um, you know, what should I do? Changing your colors like a chameleon to respond to every person you talk to or every job that you see, you're gonna step back and you're gonna start from a place of strength. Now the last part of this framework 
I'll introduce right here. That's the opportunities in the market. This is what you cannot control. You can't control who's hiring. You can't control the economy. However, if you grounded yourself first in those things that you can control, then you can approach your career transition from a place of confidence and look for that sweet spot right there. What are the opportunities in you know, the Chicago market, say, where I can use some of my top talents and also get my needs and priorities met? And what I love about this is that I've seen it open up new possibilities for people to things that had not been on their radar, different industries, different companies. So it's a shift from who's gonna hire me and what should I do next to, you know, what can I offer and what do I truly want? Because this is really where you have the greatest opportunity to make an impact and to find something satisfactory, hopefully even fulfilling in your next chapter. All right, so now let's drill down on this framework a little bit more. It's time to do some reflection. You know, we're all so wired to go, go, go and be busy, busy, busy. So these past three months have probably been quite, um, you know, quite a different time for us. It's offered us the opportunity to really reevaluate what's important to us, how we spend our time and what we want. So I'm encouraging you hopefully to take advantage of this time when we still are not back in the hustle bustle to um, be still and to actually just be and think and give yourself this gift. It's a luxury we typically don't take until we're forced to do so. So let me give you some, some guidance on how you can start to reflect on your core competencies. And then I'm gonna show you some examples of alums that I've worked with in the past who have done this work for homework. So you can, you can see how this might play out. So the first thing I want you to do is look at your current role or your most recent role. And then I want you to go backwards, going either role by role, year by year, company by company, whatever makes the most sense for you. And I want you to answer from a list of questions I'm gonna show you in the next slide. And from your answers, you're gonna try and pull out your core competencies. I think about competencies as being broken into three different categories. So you have your more technical or functional skills, right? Product management, um, data analysis, then you have uh, knowledge, like your deep industry knowledge perhaps, so blockchain or healthcare. And then attributes are really those softer skills, right? So you're highly adaptable or you have a great level of emotional intelligence. So you're gonna be thinking about the wins and the impact because they're all accomplishment-based questions that you'll see. And, you'll, and you're gonna be thinking about what am I doing? What technical skills is I leveraging? What knowledge did I have? What softer attributes showed up to enable me to bring about this win? Now you're probably gonna start to see some patterns and ultimately you're gonna wanna have a list of you know, five to eight competencies. There is no hard or fast rule here. That's just kind of generally where I would recommend you try and land that you enjoy using. Because remember, you'll cross out things that you don't wanna be leading with anymore. And then the next part of this is that for each competency, I want you to have a small capsule of a story that you can tell that will actually make it real and illustrate how specifically you've leveraged that skill successfully in the past. You started to do a little bit of interview prep here. So here are some questions that you can ask yourself. You'll see, as I said, they all focus mostly on accomplishments. What problems did I recognize and solve? How much did I contribute to revenues or profits? What new product, program, system, or service have I introduced? Whatever applies to you. How did I save the organization money or time and how much? How did I effectively manage others? In what decision-making or planning did I participate? What awards, bonuses, or promotions did I receive? Recognition. What challenges have I overcome? And what am I known for? So this should be a good starting ground for you. And I also want you to apply some of these questions to other areas of your life too. Volunteer work, organizations, activities, or teams that you might be part of outside of work in your leisure time. And you might even wanna look at it through the lens of being a parent or a partner or a friend or a sibling, right? We've all had to overcome challenges these past few months as we've been quarantined at home with our loved ones. So what skills have served you well or perhaps not well? So good time to reflect on that. I want you to really just stretch your thinking here, right? About your skills and abilities. 
life is more than just your job. So don't limit your perception of your skill set to just work or job related activities. Your ability to manage your life is a function of a much broader skill set. So this exercise really offers you the opportunity to step back and regain some perspective. So now I want to show you a couple of examples. As I mentioned earlier, I've got alums who've done this work before. This is an example of an alum, I um, masked the company names for privacy, who you know, got those accomplishments and started to pull out his strengths. So you'll see themes of storytelling, communication, uh, multidisciplinary, kind of cross-functional communication, product innovation, and innovation in general start to show up here. So you can start to do something really simple, simple here with a two-column spreadsheet. And then as I mentioned, once you've landed on those skills, the second part to this is honing those skills into short, compelling, tangible stories that clearly illustrate how you were successfully leveraging the skill in the past. So for each of your you know, five, eight, 10 skills, whatever you land on, you wanna have a little capsule, I call them capsules of stories that you, that you create. And so this is a different alum who then took his own strengths list and put it into stories. And as I said earlier, this is essentially grounding you for interview prep, or you might wanna expand upon some of these stories when you're in informational interviews. Your ability to drive your career forward is always going to hinge on how well you make your value real to others. So you've got to figure out how to make that contribution show up and be tangible in your conversations with whoever your audience is, a recruiter, a hiring manager, maybe even an investor or a client. And the second part I'd say to this is practicing these stories uh, and doing it out loud, I highly recommend having these stories um, able to convey in a very concise manner, and I mean like 60 to 90 second tops because you will lose people, is really hard. So practice out loud, you know, tape yourself on your phone, listen to yourself, continue to hone and tweak the story until it can be comfortable um, and, you know, not robotic, but just very prepared and confident. Remember what I said earlier, preparation and confidence are key parts of this transition. So give yourself the gift of confidence by being prepared here. All right, so that's that strength circle. Now let's move over to our require desire list. So this is about your needs and your preferences. And in the past, when I've worked with alums, we've typically landed, you know, things that land on this list go around geographical location, right? I need to live here, I need to stay here, or I'm be open to, you know, these other locations. Commute, like I said, when we have a commute, these, this is gonna be great. Compensation and benefits, that whole total package, it's pretty much a need for most of us, but how much? And I have um, salary negotiation and compensation conversation webinars that you can look at as well to help you with this. The culture of the company, the mission of the company, impact, the size of the company, the people that you'll be working with, that you'll be working for, that will be working for you, autonomy, the trajectory of your career, where it might take you, the scope of your role, the power or influence that you're hoping to have or that you must have, travel. I work with consultants every year who wanna get off the road. Just your, your security, right? Financial security or job security, any flexibility needs that you have. And this is just a catch-all bucket, you know, lifestyle considerations. What's important to you? What, um, what do you need? What do you want in order to have that work-life flow that's important to you? So take some time to consider this list and set your own parameters around these fields. And in addition to looking at this list for inspiration, think about times where you know, you've really just been loving your work or your job. So go back to opportunity, like those times and think about what was happening, what was going on for you to make it so effortless. And perhaps that will open up some new um, additions to this list well, as well. Now, the next step with this list is ranking it. You're then gonna use it as a touchstone when you're starting to evaluate what opportunities in the market you can target that are gonna allow you to meet your higher prioritized facets of this list. This is a really good list to use as well if you're considering multiple paths or even if you have multiple job opportunities. I've worked with alums in the past who, you know, all things being equal with different offers uh, where their strengths and their skills would be utilized, 
chose to prioritize commute over compensation. Um, or even, you know, the fact that they don't have to travel anymore versus other things. So this is a great touchstone to use. Now I've got another visual from another alum who then took those parameter or those fields that we just talked about and he put his own take on them and really made it real for himself by weighting them in terms of his priority. So this is just a Google Doc that he did. I will also point out that, you know, if you look at the bottom, you see his other um, tabs, he's really ready to go. He's done that preparation and groundwork. Um, so he's ready to engage in a networked search. All right. And I also want to turn to values because your values should come into consideration as you are putting together your required desire list. Now by values, I do not mean your morals or your ethics. Values are actually very intrinsic to us. They, they define us and they are kind of part of the essence of who we are, but they're not always conscious for us. So clarifying your values makes conscious for you things that are important to you. And why I always stress the clarification of values is because you want your work to align with at least some of your key values. Sometimes people have a, you know, a work persona. So they are, they have to adapt and conform to being one way at work. And then when they finally get out of work, they become a different person. They can be kind of who they are, right? Or you might have, I've seen it work the other way. I've, I worked with a doctor once who really felt like work was his, you know, where he was able to be who he was. And he had to conform once he got out um, and interacted with the, with the world outside the hospital. So, you know, the point is, we want these two identities, both your professional identity and your personal identity, to be the same, right? You want to be who you are in every aspect of your life. That's what makes work not feel like work. So let me give you an example of values, and I'll use a personal example, since I can't pull from you all, since we're not live uh, at Sloan today. So I have a value of, um, Adventure. I would say now that I'm a little older, it's more like just variety and new experiences. But when I was younger, you know, every weekend was a different road trip. I went bungee jumping. I hiked mountains. I was always looking for the next coolest thing to do. Now I'm a little older, so it is more about, you know, what new restaurant can we try or get takeout from in, the, in this day and age? Um, a new, trying something new on the menu, a new cocktail or a new fun family appropriate experience. But the point is, I could have never been an accountant because I do not like the same old, same old. I don't like getting stuck in a routine. Now, this value of variety is actually honored in my work as an executive coach at Sloan, where I get to work with alums. Every person is different. No two alums, no two alums are the same. And I am never bored because there's always a new situation to explore with an alum. So let me share some of the ways that I've helped alums assess their values. And one of these is by doing an exercise called peak experience. Now, we're not gonna be able to do this today, unfortunately. I love to do it in live workshops and I love to do it one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm gonna tee it up for you and I'm gonna ask you to do this yourself sometime after this webinar. So here's the gist. A peak experience is a moment in time, or it could be a period of time, when life was sweet and you are completely yourself. So it could be doing something you love or an amazing life experience like hiking Mount Kilimanjaro or crossing a finish line or just an amazing vacation or just even sitting in the backyard with someone you love. It could also be um, a period of time, perhaps your college years or your childhood summers. It could be personal or professional in nature and it could have occurred at any point in time, childhood, adolescence, you know, last week. So what I typically do is a short visualization to revisit a peak experience. And I want you to do this. So you're gonna go somewhere by yourself, quiet space, something to record your, your memories on. And I want you to just go back to a time when you were thriving and when you were happy and write down what it was all like. Just soak it up. So who you were with, where you were, what you were doing, and really engage all the senses here. The sights, the sounds, the weather, you know, the smells, the taste, whatever was going on. Get all those senses engaged. And just enjoy this, you know, go back into time, think about that moment, 
and then write about it. And from your writing in your memories, I want you to analyze your peak experience to see if you can extract some of your values from what you wrote down. The reason these memories are peak experiences for you is because they were times when you were completely living your values. That is, you were completely yourself. It's pretty cool. So let me just say, when I shared my value of new experiences in, in variety, it came from a peak experience I had in Thailand almost 20 years ago. When I was there, I just loved traveling. I loved exploring. Every day was a new adventure. I loved to soak up the culture, try the food, um, learn as much as I could, connect with the, the locals. It was just really an amazing experience. And, you know, so from that experience and remembering that experience, I pulled out values for me of, you know, travel or adventure, learning, um, connecting with others. Now, if you think about it, I express these values in my work. I always get to work with new alums that give me a new experience. I get to learn about them. I get to help them explore what's important to them. And I get to build that one-on-one -on -one relationship. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of, um, you know, acknowledgement as to how values can be important in work. And I highly encourage you to do this exercise. And I think if you actually do a few peak experiences, You'll find that with each one, you're going to find some overlap in underlying values that you find, and you might even pull out some new ones from time to time. So when we look at this with a career lens, the reason this is important is because when you're true to your values, it actually takes the weight off of those external messages or judgments that oftentimes come up when you're thinking about what's next, right? Those shoulds that come up. So rather than thinking about you know, what should I want and what should I need? It's really like, you know, what's going to resonate with who I am at the core, knowing that I have these particular, this particular way of being. Two other quick, fun ways to, um, to clarify values. So what are the things that drive you nuts? I call that, those are your values being suppressed. So um, I spoke with an alum just this week who mentioned to me that she is just going crazy because no one's wearing masks where she lives and um, she, find, she finds that to be you know, so offensive. So I got a little curious and tur we turned that around in, in terms of what is that an indicator of a value that she might have? And she pulled out that you know, she's always been a rule follower, follower. She values consistency, she values fairness. And so how might that inform you know, how she's done in the past in different workplaces and how might that be an indicator of something that she's looking for as she you know, evaluates opportunities. Another way to think about values and how you can pull out those values are things that you must have in your life. Maybe even think about what do I spend my money on, right? So if you are someone who has a you know, regular exercise regimen, you know, and you're very disciplined about your, your um, exercise, maybe there's some indicators there, um, not just health, but you, know, you wanna have that um, you care about your appearance. You care about how you show up. Um, if you're a gambler, maybe you're just a risk taker. So I think you're starting to get the, the picture here. You want to think about those things that you want or, or that you must have and how they might inform career decisions that you could make. So I really wanted to touch on this uh, values piece. It, always, it doesn't always translate as well online. It's much better in a one-on-one -on -one or a group experience. But I do think it can be a really important addendum to your required desire list. And as I said, given the state of the world where we've all you know, been given this unique opportunity to slow down our lives, um, I'm hoping it might, it might be more um, real for you or might be more, more interesting for you to think about. All right, so we're getting into the home stretch. Let's look at where we've been. So first, you are going to go through the questions I gave you and start to flesh out a list of your core competencies. You're gonna cross out the things you don't wanna do anymore. And you're gonna be left with you know, a list of five to eight skills. So curate that list. And from there, you're gonna create short, tangible stories that illustrate the strengths that you want to use um, moving forward. Then you're going to create your required desire list, right? Values are also gonna be part of this red circle. So think about those priorities and then you're gonna rank it in order of what's most important to you at this age and stage of your career. 
Oh, and I just want to say one more time before I move on, I really encourage you to do these lists. You know, this is an opportunity for you to examine what's worked and what hasn't worked and to really set a new direction for yourself. So it's going to be a direction that's based on, you know, things that you have thoughtfully chosen and considered. This prep work also gives you so much more traction in your search. You guys would not believe the people who come to me and they've been disappointed or delayed um, or frustrated in their search. And it's because they had not taken the time to truly think about what they wanted, what they needed, and how to talk about it and position themselves in a, it, from a place of strength, right? So just know that there's no quick fix here. You really need to do that groundwork if you want to get more um, traction in your transition. It's a gift. Okay, so let's continue to move forward. What comes next is taking this groundwork, taking these lists that you've done, and crafting it into what I call your career narrative, which is basically a fancy word for pitch. So, you know, you've created a story about your strengths and skills, and now you want to create a story about you. So um, let's talk about the verbal narrative, that, that actual, the, what you'll do in a face-to-face -face situation. So product managers know that they need to clearly define their product before they're going to be able to sell their product. And obviously the same thing applies to you here. You need to be very clear and articulate your value if you are in effect going to you know, sell yourself. So now that you've taken the time to define you, you can then begin to position yourself with your written and your verbal narrative. Now, what goes into this narrative? I want you to answer three questions. The first question is, who am I? This is your professional identity. So for example, I could use my current job title. I'm an executive coach and a career strategist at MIT Sloan, where I work with alumni in transition. It could also be introducing yourself and your function. I'm a COO in the healthcare space. Or it could be a little longer and quickly detail your career path and your impact. I've got some examples so I'm going to read here. I'm a senior operations executive who throughout my career has consistently built products, programs, and services that have transformed the organizations for which I've worked. The next question, what do I do well? And maybe an example. So this is where you're going to pull from that core competencies list. Make sure to include the most relevant, compelling examples of your experience, those problems you're good at solving, right? So you make sure your impact is clear. Here's an example. At Boeing, I leveraged my expertise in the lean method to streamline operations, create efficiencies and synergies that resulted in $2 million in cost savings for my department. The next question is what do I want to do next and why? So this alludes to that require and desire list. So it could be something simple. I'm looking for a new role where I can leverage my product management expertise in a high growth tech firm in the Bay Area. If you're not seeking and you're thinking about putting together this narrative, I often um, instruct people to end it with something like, you know, the work I'm best at or the work I love to do or the work I'm inspired by, something like that. And I do recommend first doing your verbal narrative, something you can deliver in a fluid, concise, no longer than a minute, you know, understandable statement that clearly outlines, you know, who you are, what you do well, and what you're looking to do next and why. So you want it to be something you can comfortably convey. And going back to that idea I mentioned earlier about thinking about your career in permanent beta, this narrative is always going to be in permanent beta as well. So it's a good principle of career management to always have a narrative at the ready. So since we're not live today, we can't really practice verbal narratives. And so what I'm going to do now is turn to written narratives in the form of LinkedIn profile summaries from alums that I've worked with in the past. And we're going to see how well they answered these three questions. So first, I want to turn to Nick. So Nick's, I'll read it for you because I assume not everybody can actually read this. So think about those three questions. I'm a product leader at NASDAQ, where I work to build the technology that powers global capital markets. Through my career, I've excelled at stepping into the white space, which has involved building new products and features to delight customers, as well as new systems to improve the flow of business. Examples of my innovative work include creating a product planning process that I led across 12 scrum teams, 
to, you know what, my, um, I see Zoom people on my right, so I can't read the, the, what's in the right corner. Anyway, we're gonna keep going to contributions to a financial technology product and building a virtual reality application that enables sales teams to leverage emotion to close deals. Cool. I'm at my best when diving into a new challenge. I'm known for setting and attaining ambitious goals, and I love working in high-performing teams. Cultures I thrive in are those that are product-driven and allow me to create. So in three short sentences, he's answered the who am I, product leader, what I do well, here throughout my career, I've excelled in doing these things with an example, and where when he's at his best. Let's take a look at another person. I'm just gonna grab a sip of water too. All right, so Julie, um, if you watch my most updated LinkedIn uh, webinar that I gave in January, I highlighted Julie as well. At the time she wrote this, she was actually job seeking and I wanted to show an example of how someone might put that out there in a narrative. So let me read this. A mission-driven healthcare marketing executive, I bring expertise in product management and marketing to standard of care changing medical technologies. My sweet spot is in the critical in-between space with new technologies, connecting the dots between customers, development and commercial teams to make great products happen. Most recently at Align, I led a team through the successful development and launch of the next generation Invisalign product for teams. After developing deep customer insights, I translated these needs into requirements and then ensured we made the inevitable trade-offs during development while preserving critical value and gaining alignment at each milestone. Finally, I developed a launch package anchored with a compelling value message and a comprehensive strategy to drive adoption. Coming off to rewarding and challenging opportunities at startups, which unfortunately were short-lived due to organizational changes, I'm currently seeking a strategic role in either product management or product marketing. Ideally, this would be in a smaller connected device digital health company where I can marry my med tech evidence-based development experience with a consumer tech's agile user-centered design approach. So this one is a little bit longer, but it still answers those questions. She's a healthcare marketing ex executive. And she gave a very clear and specific example of how she's made an impact and driven things forward in the past. And she really, really used that require desire list to um, clearly you know, define what she wants next and why she put it out there. And it was successful for her. She actually did um, land a job and part and parcel of I think how she got there was how well she was able to effectively communicate her story and position herself both in person and here online, as you can see. All right, I'm gonna show you one more. And my last example is a fun example because what I want you to know is that, you know, I want your narratives to be conversational yet professional in tone, but they can really demonstrate your personality and your character. So even when you look at Nabil with his colorful background and he's used a heart in his first sentence, here's how he, uh, here's his narrative. I love lean entrepreneurship. An experienced business development, sales and product professional, I love the journey of understanding people's deep-seated needs and delivering product experiences that delight them. My superpowers are quickly surfacing the needs of users, validating new product ideas, and building win-win partnerships. Over my career, I've launched three startups, including a UX consultancy that has helped Fortune 100 companies identify and build new products that drive long-term strategy. Today, I work at Mural to help teams around the globe, I think it says that, unlock the power of design and collaboration across time and distance. Okay, so it's a different tape on it. You know, he's using words like superpowers. He's got his heart emoji. Obviously, if that is not who you are and does not resonate with you, you know, don't use it. But that's very much Nabil. So, you know, I want these to be authentic expressions, right? Not these kind of stilted, here's what I think you should want to hear from me, right? So really talk about it and just answer those three questions. Who am I? What do I do? What do I want? What do I do well? What do I want to do next and why? And just to show you, I'm gonna have Greg and his team after this uh, webinar send you this handout right here that talks about those three questions, even gives you a few other questions to dig deeper on as you begin to position yourself effectively. So you'll be getting that um, as long as, along with um, another handout of, about alumni career resources after the webinar. 
All right, so let's talk about using your narrative. So you're gonna put this narrative together. And the reason I want you to have this narrative is because if you think back to where we started with Alice not having, not knowing where to go because she doesn't know where she wants to go, this is giving you direction. It's really using that newfound self-awareness that will come out of your groundwork for good effect. So with your narrative, you clarify for yourself and others what you bring to the table and what's important to you. You're coming from a place of intention and confidence and direction. It's also going to give you a consistent message that you can use throughout your search to clearly talk about yourself. So you're gonna use it in introductions and conversations. You'll use it in cover letters or cover notes, uh, in your resume, on your LinkedIn, it should all be a reflection of what you say in your narrative. You'll use it during the job search process when you're interviewing, and you'll even use it in your salary negotiations when you're hammering home what you bring to the table. Also, as I mentioned earlier, with the narrative, it's gonna be a work in progress. So you're gonna practice it, get comfortable with it, you know, do it in the shower when you're driving or walking or whatever so that you feel like you can say it nice and fluidly. Um, get feedback from trusted friends, from trusted colleagues, and continue to revise and tweak it along the way as you use it. Just like your career, your narrative is in permanent beta. So let's take a look at this last slide together. And what this slide is going to do is give you the steps of managing a transition. So you're going to start with where we started today, doing that self-reflection and assessment, really looking at what's important to you. I will say for MIT Sloan alums, we do have assessment tools that you're able to use through our office. Career Leader, Strengths Finder are the ones that I, I recommend so that you can really think about what that vision is going to be. And then you can bring in that, that you know, bubble. You can't control the market that we talked about earlier. Once you've done your, once you've defined what you, um, what you're going to do here in the groundwork, then you get your narrative, the verbal and the written, something you can use every day in informal conversations or maybe in more formal conversations. Then you're going to think about branding yourself. So this is your resume and your LinkedIn. Any other social media platforms that you may use, I would always say, keep in mind how you might engage on Instagram, on Twitter, even on Facebook and all these other platforms I don't even know about. I think TikTok is one, but I don't, I don't know on TikTok. Um, you might want a company bio, right, if you need that. And perhaps you have a portfolio of work that you want to show in a website or a blog or things like that. So just think about how you're positioning yourself and making sure it aligns with the work you've done in your reflection and putting together your narrative. And then the last piece to executing on a successful job search is what I call intelligent networking. I have a whole webinar on this that clearly outlines and gives you a roadmap for how to curate your contacts, how to identify second degree contacts and how look at what's related to your target and goals and how to line up introductions there, how to effectively communicate with contacts, conduct efficient, effective networking meetings in only 20 minutes with five steps, and to keep expanding your network and engage with them continuously, not only when you're in a search. So I will say this as I wrap it up, and then I've got a couple resource slides to show you. The, the people that I've worked with who have been most successful in career transitions have taken the time to take stock of their careers. They were willing to do this work. They were willing to think on where they had been successful, where they had failed, decisions that they made along the way, how they added value to a company, and what they wanted and what they needed at this point in their career. They also understood the importance of aligning values into their work. So I truly believe that if you follow the framework I've given you here, that you are going to be prepared and confident. And as I said, those are the drivers for a successful career transition. So I hope this workshop has inspired you to be more proactive in how you're managing your career, to approach your next move from a place of strength, to be strategic and to you know, assess all the possibilities that lay ahead of you because you do have possibilities. So um, as you go about and navigate your career with purpose, know that I wish you the best. So that is the end of my um, presentation, but I would be remiss if I, if I did not point you to some resources that you can use as an alum at Sloan. 
So we are so excited to have, in, to have in the last year launched a new website, which can be found at cdo.mit.edu. The alumni site is almost ready to launch, but I'm actually giving you the website here because you can still access it via this page, but for a while you'll still be asked to log in with your Sloan account and you'll be taken to a, to a different site called My Sloan. But things you can get here and the things that will be at on CDO by the end of hopefully the, the summer. We have a free job board. We have um, access to setting up coaching appointments. There's industry and company research. There's a wide variety of articles um, on job search and videos, as well as the career webinars that I've been putting together since 2018. We also have some resources around negotiating, interviewing. So definitely take the time to check it out. And Greg and his team will be sending you a handout on this as well. So you'll be getting the career, trend, the career narrative handout as well as the alumni career resources handout. And then, as I alluded to at the beginning, the state of the world is fraught. And so we have Sloan talent that are graduating or that are still seeking internships. So if you are in the position to consider hiring any of our talented grads from our portfolio of programs, not only our MBA, but our Master of Finance um, students, our Master of Business Analytics, our Sloan Fellow MBAs, or even our Executive MBAs, then we would love to hear from you. So you can email our recruiting team, uh, they're right there. I just would use this um, cdo.mitsloan at mit.edu, and we will definitely help you connect with candidates. We have free resume books at this point in the year, and we can help promote your company and roles with clubs, with individuals, and within our system. So that is it for me, Greg. I'm gonna toss it back over to you. Sorry for the technical difficulties at the beginning, but. Hopefully we're good to go now. Great, thank you, Bryn. Uh, we really appreciate your time and we have some time for questions. So okay. um, let's jump right into it. Um, given the COVID-19 crisis um, and all of the uncertainty in the market, is now the right time for a career change? <laughs> so that's a great question and one that I have been exploring a lot with alums. I will say, I mean, there's no one size fits all answer here, right? It's gonna be very individual depending on your situation. Um, for some people, it might be a matter of finances. For some people, it just may be an answer of industry or what they were hoping to do. Generally speaking, I have been giving this advice. And again, I'm a career coach. I'm never gonna tell somebody yes or no without having a, a I'm, not, I'm typically gonna have you figure it out, but you know, without knowing more information, here's what I can offer. I do think that this, the, there is a pandemic, there is a ensuing recession, right? So there may be expectations or goals that you might've had in mind for 2020 that you might have to put aside for a while, not forever, but just for a while. Um, I was telling someone yesterday, I heard a podcast where this um, guy was talking about how he had really focused, he'd wanted 2020 to be a year where he wrote a book, right? So he's hard at work on his book, lining things up, then this happened. So rather than work on the book, which had been his goal, he's shelved that and invested his time and energy into, you know, adapting his business virtually so that he can still continue to connect with clients and consumers. So I do think you might need to consider letting go of something. At the same time, you've got to also think, what can I continue to drive forward? What can I take action on? So I don't think that just because you put the brakes on one thing that you can't then keep moving forward. And frankly, I think the framework I'm giving you today is a great place to start because those are things that you can do now. And then you can thoughtfully consider, given this climate, what makes, what makes sense for you? What works for your situation? I hope that gives a little, you know, kind of a little bit of a starting point. It does. Thank you, Bryn. <laughs> um, so next question we have is, how might I evaluate a job opportunity that is a step back um, or a lower level uh, from your current career trajectory? Mm -hmm. So again, generally speaking, because I don't know um, circumstances, I don't recommend taking something that is a step back 
if you're still in the same industry or function, you should be always thinking about leveraging and evolving on your experience. However, you know, perhaps there are some extenuating circumstances here. Maybe you are moving to a new country uh, or maybe you are returning from a long career break. In those cases, perhaps it makes sense for you to consider taking something that is um, lower than the level that you might expect. Um, but I will say this, I have worked with alums who have come from that very reactive place, right, where they, they were acting more out of panic and fear, and that was driving their, their um, decision to just take something, even if it was, you know, if it was beneath them. So a compensation level or perhaps a, a title that was lower than really what they could have gotten in the market. And in those situations, they were resentful. So I would think about those things, and hopefully that can help inform your decision. Um, again, I'll go back to the framework I, I put out here. And um, I do feel like if you are coming at it from a place of strength, you should be able to evaluate that opportunity and know that if you do indeed accept it, even if the role is beneath you, that you've done so consciously, knowing that you're getting something else that you want and need out of the deal. Great. That's Thank you, that. Corinne. Mm -hmm. And another question is if someone is currently in between opportunities or they're in the midst of that job search, um, how should they explain in an interview setting that gap in the resume or kind of what they're doing uh, in that uh, in-between time? Yeah, so that's a very real situation right now. I'm working with several alums who, because of the pandemic, have been um, fired or fired, furloughed, or, you know, co the companies had to restructure. So, well, here's the thing, you know, you're going to address it. You're going to own it. I mean, this is part of your career. And so what I would say is you don't dwell on it. You don't, when you're explaining it, you don't take up a lot of air time talking about it. Um, and in order to do that, though, that means you need to be practiced, right? So let me go back to um, something I mentioned in my webinar, Intelligent Networking, which might be a good one for people to watch if they are indeed interviewing and in this situation. So what I say there is, you know, first of all, if you have recently been let go, do not dive into a job search immediately. You're not gonna be in the right headspace. You're not gonna be giving, giving kind of that energy you need to be giving that's gonna help you move along, right? You're not gonna, I talk about gaining allies in a job search. If you're negative or bitter, you're not going to be doing yourself any favors. So when you're in transition, as all of us are right now, so I'm betting everyone can, re this will resonate. When you're in transition, it's kind of akin to the five stages of grief. I mean, you go through sadness, anger, um, like shame even, guilt. So I don't feel like when you're in that space, you can really talk about your the gap in your resume, right? So point is, we want a positive mindset here. You know, we've all been in transition. When you get to the point where you can talk about what happened in a very matter of fact and positive tone, then you're good to go. And I would just address that. I mean, the way we've been, I've been working with alums is they're saying, due to the pandemic, my job was eliminated, so I'm now looking. I mean, and of course, the pandemic seems that, you know, that's something everyone understands. But even if there has been something that's gone wrong, you don't have to dwell on it, and you don't even have to give a lot of um, specifics around it. Just own it, made the decision to part ways, or I'm now looking for something new, or I left on good terms, or, you know, there's a number of ways you can talk about it that's not going to be negative, because that's the most important thing. That's probably that what I should have said at the beginning. Just don't be negative. Own it. Don't be negative. It's really about being having a confidence play, right? Great. Thanks, Bryn. And also doing all of the prep work that you recommend and that you've outlined here. So thank you for Definitely. that. Definitely. Yeah. So we do have a question about um, actually because we're all online right now. Uh, <laughs> Zoom is uh, our mode for a lot of these interactions or interviewing, networking. I know, Bryn, you have an entire webinar on intelligent networking that we mm. recommend to alumni. But if you could just quickly, um, if you have any tips uh, for interviews over Zoom right now, just some quick tidbits. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. So this is so important, guys. So Interviewing over Zoom, I would say you want to make sure that you think about your space, right? Because it's so much about how you show up. So make sure that you're in a quiet space when you're interviewing. Um, think about your background, right? I'm in my family office here. 
Um, so make sure that whatever's on the walls behind you is not too distracting. Um, of course I see, and then I see like big <laughs> handprints over my shoulder. So maybe do as I say, not as I do. The other piece is you want to be front lit. Okay. So I have two windows in front of me here. If I were to sit on this other side, I would be in a shadow. So make sure you're front lit. I even have a, a lamp here. Um, and your camera angle, so important. How many of you have been on Zoom meetings and you're looking at somebody's nose? So you know, make sure you're tilting your camera so that you're square, you're head on. I actually have my laptop um, propped up on a shoebox just to give that height so that it's um, eye level. So you make sure that your, you know, your screen isn't up looking at the ceiling and it's not too far down. That's gonna give you, you know, the best setting since you can't show up in person. Also, you know, think about getting dressed. You know, I, even though I'm at home today, I put on a jacket. Um, I am just as I would if I were presenting. So make sure that you do that and mimic kind of what you would do so that you have that, um, that confidence. And then I'll, I plugged this in my intelligent networking webinar, but I'll just say this too. I really like Amy Cuddy's TEDx talk on the power of body language. Before you go into any high stakes situation, like an interview, especially online, Amy talks about um, this power pose. And it's just basically standing for 30 seconds to two minutes in kind of an open pose. Apparently that does something with your brain neurons to make you seem more confident. Some scientists have tried to debunk this, but I have found it to be helpful for me. Um, and I've had alums use it to good success. So hopefully those things can help you, you know, um, perform well in an interview. Great lighting, front lit, square on, think about your background, dress professionally, do your power pose. <laughs> Great, thank you, Bryn. And maybe one last question before we close. Um, for an alum who is maybe more experienced or more senior in their career, maybe they're nearing retirement or maybe not quite ready yet, um, can you give any comments on navigating job search or transition um, in the twilight years of your career? Sure. I mean, I, you know, what comes to mind when you say that, I think about Julie Sidor, whose profile I just showed um, on her LinkedIn. She's someone who's senior, has been there, done that, um, and, you know, just conducted a successful job search by following the steps. So I don't want to, you know, kind of push you back to the webinar, but doing that groundwork is important. But I also think that maybe hidden in that question is, something around ageism, perhaps, which is something that people worry about. And I always say, what well, you can't do anything about it. So own your career, all your experience, and celebrate your experience, you know? So think about this. The longer you've worked, the more of a network you have. And again, I'll refer you back to intelligent networking because it's not just, you know, your professional contacts. It's really who you know and thinking about who they know. So networking, I think, can be a lot easier for people who are more experienced, even if you haven't been you know, engaging in what you think are networking activities. It's really about thinking about who you know and approaching networking, because I do think at a senior level, it's gonna be a network search, right? You're not finding your job on a job board. You know, it's either gonna be that or engaging with a recruiting firm, but you know, networking for you should be about doing research. It should be very relational and reciprocal. I always talk about offering to be of help um, in addition to asking for advice and information, you want to find champions in your search, people that you've hopefully treated well and impressed in the past that are willing to, to really be an ally for you. And that's how you're going to best, you know, move it along and insert yourself into that hidden job market that really does exist for, mo for most executive level jobs. It really is a networked search, I think, that greases the wheels. I hope that helps. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping I answered the question. Yes, thank you, Bryn. Okay. Uh, yeah. We so appreciate your time today, and I'd like to thank our viewers for joining us. To keep this conversation going over social media, you can use the hashtag Sloney Reunions. I also wanna say thank you to our generous alumni who have given to the Sloan Annual Fund and the Immediate Needs and Emerging Opportunities Fund. We hope you'll join us for our next virtual reunion session tomorrow at 12 noon Eastern time. Professors Roberto Rigobon and Jason Jay will present on the promise of a sustainable future. We'll see you then and take care everyone. Bye everybody, thanks. <laughs>